But I do want you to share with us a little bit about your background and how long you've been doing this and how you've kind of gotten to the advanced level. But I don't want to spend too much time on the advanced level. I want to focus on the beginner level. Um, so maybe if you don't mind, start out by telling everybody a little bit about you and what you've been doing and how long you've been doing this and why you love seminar marketing so much. Yeah. So back in the early... Uh, around 2013, I went to work for an RIA out of Dallas, Texas, and I kind of got kind of a front row seat, if you will, to someone who was heavily marketing and hosting workshops. He was driving all of his attendance by the radio. And so I just quickly learned that uh, I, I, I would have people come to a simple workshop and then have an appointment in our office and then hand over our life, their life savings to us. And I right. thought, wow, uh, I mean, that, that quit. Uh, yeah. Now, and that, I, I guess, to be fair, they had probably listened to the radio show for some time, right? But I, I was just, and I was a young, younger person at the time, I was just blown away. And day, time, day after day after day, we just kept moving just a fair amount of money, right? And so anyway, uh, when I left uh, that organization um, and you kind of go back to your the beginning, like, well, how am I going to do all this? What, what am I going to do? I thought, huh, I can't compete with the, the amount of ad spend that, you know, when I always, when you always think you're big, there's always somebody bigger, right? <laughs> so I thought, well, I can apply some of the things that I learned uh, to what he was doing to the Medicare market because I, yeah. I kind of learned that nobody was really doing that. I, what, I always have to, and I'll be careful how I say this. The Medicare world is kind of broken up into a few few parts. One is you have the carriers and then their captive agent field forces, and then you have kind of the call center world. And, right. and both of those, to me don't feel like competitors in a way uh, because they're both kind of fighting with one arm behind their back at all times where right. when you have a true independent agent, which I don't feel like is proudly uh, yelled from the mountaintops like it should be because that really yeah. is a viable thing in this world. People really do appreciate a good insurance agent um, and that's something my dad's done studies on, you know, that's just a lot of fun to learn. It's like, wow, people really do, uh, not only do they, they want to sit down with somebody and explain their options, explain how this stuff works. So anyway, at the end of the day, um, I, I, I kind of applied this Medicare. What I learned uh, with the seminars is if you want to really go big, and that's just up to you, um, then you have to dominate. And the only way to do that is you do have to spend a lot. It, it is true, but you, you, it's not necessarily money equals sales, but in some degree, that's how it works. Uh, yeah. But at the end of the day, it's a volume thing, Andy. So yeah. you just, yeah, you got to do more events and it doesn't necessarily mean you have to do huge events. You just have to yeah. do a bunch of them. So you can still do yeah. small towns and do this on a more sure. affordable scale. So. Yeah. So, so now you've been doing Medicare turning 65 I, I, seminars. Yeah, I kind of started doing those about 2018. Okay, so, so about uh, six years ago. Yeah, five, six years ago where I just put 100% focus on it and yeah. never looked back. And yeah. uh, and it, and I, there's no reason for me to stop. It's just, it's worked so well. Even through COVID, it worked like crazy, right? So, so if you got a three-month window in the life of Aaron, what does that look like in terms of how many seminars do you think you would do in a three month period? Because one of the reasons I ask is because we're asking agents to make a commitment yeah. for at least three months. They can't do this one and done because it's never going to work great on the first one. And if they're that, you know, and it is a commitment because of the investment involved that you already mentioned. But um, so anyway, I'm sorry. So three month period about how many seminars? Uh, I would say like if you really want to boogie, without overloading yourself and then just wasting money, you would like to have a workshop if you can, financially, I get it. I'd say one every three weeks. Every three weeks is a nice schedule. So if you're just say, let's say in three months, let's just say three different events, yeah. Okay, okay, that makes sense. So let's, uh, in preparation for this call, um, you had, you and I have been discussing what are some key 
elements that agents who are getting started with this need to know. And we broke it into five things. So I want to just kind of go through the list. It was the venue. So I want you to talk a little bit about how you pick a venue. The length of the seminar, maybe you could, you don't have to go into detail as to every aspect of it, but just kind of give us a rough framework of the length of the seminar, what materials you use. I think one of the soft skills that you become so good at are things like tone, like how do you deliver the message, not just what are you saying, but how you're saying it. And then perhaps the most important part in order to make this effective What's the close? What do you say or how do you end this thing to where seemingly almost everybody signs up to talk to you one on one? So that was kind of the top five things. If it's OK with you, I'd like to just dig into each one. Let's start with the venue. What are your thoughts? And by the way, where was your seminar last week? Las Vegas. Well, wait a minute. You don't live in Vegas. You don't even live in Nevada. <laughs> Not even close. <laughs> OK, well, then you're going to have to really explain to me how you came to pick a venue in Las Vegas when you don't live anywhere near Nevada. Yeah. So I think at the end of the day, out of all the things we're going to go over today, I think the venue, ironically, is probably the most important and the least important thing you've got to pick, right? I mean, truthfully, I think agents in general get real bogged down on this one. And I would tell you, don't worry about the venue. I've literally had a seminar on a patio <laughs> and so and the only reason I would do that every time because it was so pleasant and yeah. after I had that workshop that day I remember thinking man I didn't even think if the weather had been sour this would have been terrible <laughs> but so I would say out of all the things to worry about the venue is one of the least important things um, okay. I, I I've done workshops now in 11 states Oh, and wow. I, one of the, 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 I would say the least nicest places I've ever had one is a, a, a little sports bar in Omaha, Nebraska. And boy, did I nail it when I just randomly picked that venue because it's like a local favorite. It's a bar and man, they just came and I had 55 people in the room and it was a buffet and nobody even cared. And I think the, uh, it was like $9 a plate, Andy. You know, to, so uh, I will say uh, it's my opinion that you should serve food. Um, if you're if, if you're gonna do this, I think you'll be more successful if there's food involved. Um, sure. And it's really, I think that uh, people, if you, I came from a financial planning background, so you hear this term a lot. I don't like the term, but the people use term like people just come for the food, basically. And I'm like, yeah. actually. I don't, I think it's ironically, you're not thinking about it the right way. If you think that way, I think people like yeah. to come. It's a safe place. Yeah. Um, I, you wouldn't believe how many people show up that are single females. Um, yeah. A single female has a different perspective than a, than a male. And so they, they want to come and break bread. And basically yeah. it's, it's a comfortable thing. So yes, you need it. I, I think the the main thing to focus on is a nice venue with food. That's yep. it. I don't think it really matters where you have it. I know guys that are having these at an IHOP to a Denny's to a, an yep. Olive Garden. It just doesn't. Cracker Barrel. Yeah. That's right. So, but what about the space itself? I mean, are you, are you using like a back room? Is this like out in the open? Are you like yelling over the patron to the left of you that's trying to have dinner? Great question. Yeah. So when I first started doing this, um, I would actually go and find people that weren't open for, so you can pick what time of day you would like to do this too, right? Uh, right. And there's different theories on this also. Um, you could do something at lunch, you could do something for dinner. I don't, again, you're splitting hairs, I think, you know, uh, so everybody's got their own take on this. But yes, I think that you would like to find a venue, if possible, that either has a private room, right? Um, and that you have space to talk and then no, you're not part of the general dining okay. room. Yeah. Okay, okay. Okay, so now, uh, and, and going back to the Omaha um, location. So agents that are in this program though, they're only gonna be doing them uh, doing this locally. 
So in their own market, meaning wherever it is they happen to be, we have uh, several people like there's somebody in Atlanta and there's somebody in Charlotte. So they should already have at least an idea of their local area. You just got lucky in Omaha, but that really, for a new agent, they should have a pretty decent idea of their local area and the kind of places that might be available that have a private room or a back room or whatever it is. So that shouldn't be too tough. Lunch or dinner sounds like it doesn't really matter. Just pick one and, and go with it. Um, and it sounds to me like um, people are pretty flexible. I think we get ourselves too wrapped up in, hey, this isn't going to be good enough for that. And the truth is people are just happy to come and be a part of it. And then the other interesting uh, comment that you made is that you're you're not finding that people are just coming to waste your time and just eat free food, that they're coming to learn. And the food is a benefit of coming, but it's not where there's just a bunch of time wasters. Is that a decent summary of venue? Yeah. What I learned to do is by having a workshop all the time, often, is that I don't worry about stuff like that anymore. Yeah. I, 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 I can admit when I first started and maybe I had eight or 15 people in the room and then I was, you know, collecting yellow sheets is what I call them. Um, they look like this. It's just what somebody oh. fills out after a workshop. I just call them a yellow sheet. Yeah. Uh, I would be like, oh, how many yellow sheets do I get? Now I just collect them and move on. <laughs> I yeah. don't think about it and I'm not worried about it. But yes, I would say if I'm working my local area, then you know what's a nice spot. I would say anything close to a freeway that's just easy to get to, that's got good parking, you know, just oh, the no. normal things that you, yeah. you know, something that's easy to find that everybody knows that's got good parking, that nothing that's complicated because again, I, I always tell everybody one time I was trying to find it. If I can't find it, then they're right. never going to find it. And I'm pretty good with that. So I'm like, oh, my gosh. So, yeah, uh, okay. it's just little things like that. But, yeah, uh, good lighting. Again, you know, if you're doing lunchtime, you don't worry. I, you know, shoot, try to find a place that's not even open for lunch um, yeah. and see if they'll, you know, say, hey, I'll take care of the staff. If you'll just let me come. And good boy, you got the whole restaurant. And then the size of the restaurant isn't as important anymore because you have the whole restaurant. Got it, got it, got it. Uh, you mentioned parking, and I, meant, I want to make sure we're not spending too much time on venue. Um, that seems to me like ease of finding it and parking. Because if somebody's got to pay 10 bucks to go park in a parking garage, you're probably going to have people drive off and say, yeah, I ain't doing that. Worst workshop I ever did was in downtown Portland. I would never do it again. And it didn't have its own parking. Uh, I learned a valuable lesson that day. I will never do that again. I always, I hate to say it, but I always do now my workshops, all of them in the suburbs. Suburbs, yeah. No, totally time. makes sense. Yeah. yeah. So now we got a venue. We got a location. We pick lunch or dinner. We've got plenty of good parking um, and access. Now let's talk about the actual seminar. Walk us through kind of how you, again, not, we're not going to go through all the details of everything you talk about, but maybe just the structure of it, kind of how you started, how you ended, maybe a little bit about what's in the middle. So uh, I happen to do all my workshops at lunch. That's what I do. Um, I used to do all dinner seminars forever and ever and ever, and I have small children, you know, and so uh, at some point I just shifted more for my own personal circumstances, it had nothing to do with the success of dinner versus lunch. It was just really because I had small children. <laughs> um, my kids are starting to grow up a little bit, but I just haven't changed. Uh, so here's my general format. People usually start showing up somewhere between 1030 and 11. Oh, I, uh, one of the things I will tell you that's a good idea, the workshop companies, the direct mail companies that you know North American Life Plans is connected with, they do a great job of reminding people about the venue and the seminar like 24 hours out. So you're gonna get like a confirmation list right before the workshop. So people are gonna confirm that they're coming, which is great. So it kind of takes a little bit off your plate, Andy, as you're kind of getting ready for this event. You got enough to focus on. Thank goodness the workshop companies do such a good job. Um, so anyway, at the end of the day, uh, people show up 10.30 to 11, but we also send our own confirmation personally oh. to them. Just a quick email. You don't have yeah. to call them all. I get it. 
Um, I just tell everybody, if you could, I, you make the email one time, you don't have to type it every time. <laughs> and just, I and we, we do that prior than the, the 24 hours out. So it gives them yeah. a week in advance or something. Right. And I'll just say, hey, try to show up as early as possible. Oh, Around no. 1040 would be nice. And here's why I do that. Oh. I've tested this both ways. And let me tell you why I think it's important. If you don't do the special email that says, hey, if I were you, um, show up a little bit early. Our events are well attended. People will uh, show up right at 11 o'clock. Yeah. And, and let me tell you why that's an issue. So number one, the staff hasn't had a chance to give a drink order and their food no. order. And now you're waiting and you can't get started. And it's a little frustrating for you because you're ready to go. But what it can, where it can really bite you, and I had this happen to me once, I was kind of waiting, letting everybody get seated. And I had a gentleman came up to me. He's like, I don't have time to wait for you and left. And I'll never forget that day. And I remember thinking, well, golly, what's that guy's problem? Jeez, you know, what, what, you know, I'm, I'm smiling when I say this guy, he's kind of rude. And I thought, you know what? He's right. Yeah. <laughs> he, he doesn't have time to wait on me. Um, the fact of the matter is it was about 11 15 and i hadn't started and so yeah. i've never forgotten you that. were not and being respectful of that guy's time i wasn't even if it was I 15 wasn't, and i was hey i'm at work what do i and so i thought yeah. you know what so now i have a golden rule andy i always start at 11 05 so okay. almost everybody can wait five minutes yeah. Um, yeah and i've never had that problem again and that was years ago and i do these all the time so i would say my general no format part. is 10 yeah. 30 to 11 they show up if somebody shows up at the last second sometimes i'm pretty bold and i'll say hey i'm sorry um we'll try to get your food order in if we can't it's okay you're just gonna have to order after the event it, yeah. it's not so it's usually not your fault that they're late. They know, and, and a lot of times they're super apologetic, right? Yeah, but yeah. one of the things I've learned is you need to be bold, right? Yeah. It's your event. Yeah. This is a, basically, it's like a show. If you yeah. ever go to a play and you show up late, guess what? You're standing out in the hall yeah. during the first part. You know, you have to wait. And so Where it's the same thing. Yep. Absolutely. Um, okay, so, so it's 11.05. Um, you do your opening. You run through your presentation and how long after 1105 are you done? And we'll get to the close a little bit later. So don't don't let, let everybody know what your close is yet. To about 1205. So one, okay, one so hour. one hour. I and tell there's you, no one hour or less is the magic. No, I don't think you need to talk longer than that. There's no point. Okay. No PowerPoint. No. No projector. Nope. Any equipment at all? Speakers, microphone. Nope. No, no, that's okay. I used to do all that, um, and I just found it was more of a mess, and it, there's right. always something malfunctioning. I, I can never forget, uh, i just tell you a true story. My laptop decided, I, I literally walked up to start the thing, and because my laptop had been on for 30 minutes with kind of a cool little slideshow going, it decided to fall asleep. The moment I started talking, and it took me five minutes to get the computer back up, because this is back in time when computers are a little slower. And I remember thinking, I, I just, I'm done with this. I'm not going to do not this. Not worth anymore. it. Yeah. It yeah. isn't. It makes you look unprofessional. So now I have found that the less gadgets, you're better off. So let's focus then on material. Uh, point number three. So you mentioned the yellow sheet. Um, by the way, did you hire like some expert consultant to name that form the yellow sheet? Is that something? Absolutely not. It's okay. literally the color of yellow. So you just have a form. Is it? Is it? Um, so tell so tell us again. What do, what do you come in? You don't come in with a projector. So you have your booklet and the yellow sheet. Is that basically it? I have four things. Okay. I have a workshop booklet. Yep. And the only thing I put inside the booklet is one piece of paper and it's the yellow sheet. Okay. And I put it at, 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 at the very front. I, I don't think it matters, but I put it right in the front. So when I, it's just easier for me as I put my kits together. If you want to put it at the, at the last of the book, you can, I don't think it matters. I really don't. Um, the other 
two items I have is I also put a business card down in front yeah. of the entrance. So it's a booklet, a business card, and then I also put a pin. Okay. Okay. And I have pins made that okay. just have my my name and my phone number. Nice. It, that's it. And they're nice. They're they're and they not take, bad. And they uh, take it with them. You encourage them to take the pen. I do. Them. I say, look, one of the things, and that's part of my, uh, one of the things I say at the beginning, I say, hey, the way I used to do this is we're all looking at a PowerPoint. You're looking at the screen. I'm looking at the screen. And what I found is I couldn't see if you guys were paying, you know, following along or what if you had a question? I can tell in your eyes. So now I put the whole PowerPoint in this book. Why? So you can keep it. Yeah. You guys can make notes all over this thing. You don't have to give this back to me. And so they love that. You know, they can go home with something tangible. And mm -hmm. honestly, if you're smart, the whole first page of the book, it's just my contact information. It's a right. gigantic business card, basically. Because yeah. 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 they'll lose that little business card, but they won't lose that book. You know, I'll tell you one of the things, this is a real quick side note that I learned about materials. I one time um, was doing a seminar and I had these really, really nice booklets printed up. But I didn't think about the paper. And so when I handed them out, it was on like this. It was a beautiful uh, paper, but it was kind of waxy. Mm -hmm. And so people couldn't write. They were trying to make notes on it. Yeah. And the pen wouldn't work because the paper was waxy. And, and so that I, then I noticed... Honest. Mine's close to that. It, it's not really easy to write on. Yeah. It, it's doable, but it's close. I know what you mean. You got to be careful with that. Yep. <laughs> okay, so great stuff on materials. That's pretty simple, though. Uh, the um, the booklet, the uh, yellow paper, a pen, and a business card. Business yeah. cards they should already have. Every agent better have pens. Otherwise, they can get that stuff on the store. You know, easy to order, very inexpensive. And then we'll... Uh, obviously um, make booklets and yellow sheets available so agents who are in the program can um, either use the same kind of materials or, or make them themselves. No. And uh, not I use a company, uh, Andy, called uh, Myron, M-Y-R-O-N. Oh. That's who I use to order my pens. I'm just, I don't, you can use anybody, but that's who I yeah. use. Nice, it's a nice pen. It's got a little stylus at the end. A lot of oh, people nice. are like, oh, can I have an extra pen? <laughs> And you say absolutely. You knock yourself out. Here's an extra <laughs> pin. Uh, yeah. All right. So let's um, move on to tone. Why is tone so important? Why can't you just run through your presentation and be done with it? What, what's huge. It sets the stage for who you are, right? Um, so one of the things I like to do is I say, look, before we get into Medicare, the first page in my book is about me. Let's get that out of the way. But if I think if you're going to talk, hear somebody speak for about an hour, you might as well know how they think. And I'm going to let you know how I think about this right now. And so I kind of go into how I'm unbiased in all this. Yeah. I, I joke with them. I say, hey, is anybody getting anything in their mailbox right now about Medicare? You should see all their hands go up. And they're like, I'm like, I feel for you guys. You get so much stuff, right? I let them know that the self-checkout world that we've entered into. I love it when I'm at the grocery store or when I'm at the airport. But besides that, I hate self-checkout. You right. know, if I need a prescription and I don't know what I'm doing, like a lot of these people, I, I need somebody to explain what this medicine is and how to take it. <laughs> and huh? you, you better have somebody around to help me. I mean, I'm still old school like that. Uh, yeah. One of the other things I go over is, you know, I know how much you guys love change. What he likes change. Everybody hates change, but I educate them on, I have to admit, if you want to save money in the Medicare game, you're going to have to do some changing along with it because it's a, a moving target, if you will. And then the big thing I go over is compensation. One of the things I don't think agents do a big enough job on it's just telling people how much money they make and how they get paid. And you shouldn't be embarrassed at all about that. I want them to know I make money, right? Yeah. I do. I just want them to know how I get paid. And I even go over how much I get paid. Um, yeah, right. One of the things yeah. I get into at one point, um, I obviously go over the basics of Medicare. I go over what Medicare supplement insurance is. 
I also go over what Medicare Advantage is, and I also go over what prescription drug coverage is. When I get to Medicare Advantage, I want them to know that I make more money selling that stuff. <laughs> I do. And I let them know, like, hey, I, I want not only do I make more money, I make lifetime commissions off of you. And I tell the whole room that. And when they when I get done and they come up to me, they're like, I just went to another workshop. You know, it's funny, Aaron, they never even brought up Medicare supplement insurance. And I'm like, now you know why? <laughs> because you make a lot of money. So, so anyway, that's how you're even competing against other agents that are only talking about Medicare Advantage. You're letting them know and it's because of the more money you shot. Uh, I like that. Being a true insurance. I'm like, look, yep. there's a couple of, you have options here. Yep. Now, what's crazy about it is that doesn't deter people from going on Medicare right. Advantage at all. <laughs> no, no, no. What you're going to find out, Andy, and, and you're well aware of this, um, there are certain just parts of the country that are just more Medicare Advantage driven Absolutely. Um, markets. And then there are some that are just more Medicare supplement driven. Uh, and I think that's why I travel around the country and do this is because that way I get a, uh, I will tell you like forever being in Phoenix and Scottsdale, um, it was a med sub market. And you, you'll laugh, guys like you, hey, why don't you write some more Medicare Advantage? And I'm like, well, I can't seem to write any of this stuff. Nobody wants it here. And then I go to different markets like Nevada, right, Las Vegas, and it's much more of a Medicare Advantage market. So I'm like, oh, okay. So what I have learned is you, if I want to write a, a big variation of product, all I got to do is just go to different markets. So. Awesome. All right, let's close this session with closing. Okay, so now you've given them a one hour. It's almost time for lunch. Their stomachs are grumbling. They've had their iced tea or whatever. Um, how do you finish this off in order to get the best results? So here's what I think. I want to give everybody a reason to fill one of these things out, this yellow sheet. No matter what your situation is, and you're about to find out why. So that's how I say it. I say, I want to give you a reason to fill out this yellow seat, no matter what your situation is, and you're about to find out why. Okay. And then what I do is I just tell them two stories real quick, and it doesn't really matter what your stories are. But at the end of the day, by telling some stories, uh, I feel like that helps. So one of the stories I tell is just a real simple one. It's just is Medicare mandatory for every American when they turn 65? It is, unless most people that are Medicare professionals know that basically everybody must go on Medicare unless you're currently employed or your spouse is currently employed. So if you're not one of those two people, you're doing this, right? I mean, really, that's basically all the people that don't go on Medicare. Now, I'm not going to get into TRICARE oh. and a retired federal employee and vet. I got, I understand all the different segments, but yeah. basically you're going on Medicare unless you're working pretty much. But one of the stories I tell is this man was working and he still has to go on Medicare. So why is that? And this will mess with people and it's because he worked for a small employer. Okay. Right. So if you work in the dentist office or an attorney's office, for anybody that has less than 20 people, Medicare is not a choice. You're doing this. Uh, um, the second story I tell them is like, hey, I, I tell a true story of one of my clients where he got a severance package when he turned 64. And uh, part of that severance package uh, was a, it was Honeywell. They paid for his benefits and paid him like he was at work. A year later, he turned 65. A couple of days later, he walked into the kitchen, wasn't feeling so hot. His wife looked at him, get in the car, roared down the street, walked into the Mayo Hospital because it's the closest hospital to their house. And uh, they basically, he had open heart surgery that day. Mayo saved his life. But a couple of weeks later, all these bills started showing up at his house, Andy, and it turns out he didn't have any health insurance. Uh -huh. What happened? So what I say is, what did I say in the first story? The Medicare is mandatory. Unless what? Unless you're going to work. Is he going to work anymore? No. He's on a severance package. Part of his package 
was Cobra. He wasn't yeah. paying attention, though. So a lot of people don't realize that without a primary, your secondary does not, is will not pay. And so that man had to cut a $300,000 check to the Mayo Hospital. Mm -hmm. for, but it's a true story, too. And so I just use my own story. Uh, but boy, I tell you what, when I get done with those two stories, they're writing as fast as they can write. <laughs> I love it. So they, just to close up this conversation, because we've got a little over, um, so they are filling out the form. And do you say, leave it at your space and lunch is coming? Do you go and collect them? And then... I just tell everybody, if it's okay, I'm going to walk around and talk to everybody. Okay. Um, and then you can hand me your yellow sheet. I actually don't bring up a lot the yellow sheet. They make a point of giving it to me. If you do a yeah. good enough job, I, I'm just not worried about it. And boy, they, but they're thing. handing them to me. Oh, Aaron, is this okay? I, I pick... Because one of the things I do do, Andy, is... I put a spot, I give like the next nine uh, days of my calendar and I let them pick a time and date. So they've already scheduled their appointment. Oh, I love it. I gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. So they, they're telling you what their availability is ahead of time. So you don't have to keep going back and forth. That's right. Love well, I it. Do that. Well, that's always love it. Yeah. Yeah. So to now, me, what I do is so crucial. At, I love it. After the workshop, now I'm just sending them a appointment confirmation. Uh, uh, very nice close. Excellent, Aaron. Hey, thank you so much for sharing your best practices. We have a whole bunch of agents that are really interested in doing seminars. It takes a commitment, but it's so great to have somebody like Aaron Hale be able to step in and provide best practices for somebody who's been doing this for years. And, and uh, why make the same mistakes that Aaron made when you can just learn from those and not duplicate them and, um, and, and keep with the best practices? Thanks so much for the time. You've been glad. Happy selling, everybody.